Greetings. This is an introduction to serial technique. I'm going to do four things today. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how serialism developed and how it functions and functioned compositionally and analytically. Second, I'm going to show you the four permutations of a 12-tone row. Third, I'm going to tell you some issues about finding a row in a piece. And four, I'm going to tell you something essential about how 12-tone rows follow one another in a piece. First, how serialism developed. Schoenberg, Berg, and Webern, and others were writing in a roughly atonal style, as we know, in the first two decades of the 20th century. All three of them, for different reasons, felt a great deal of pressure, always to have to reinvent musical style with every piece. So, on one chilly morning in April of 1923 in Vienna, Schoenberg had a cup of coffee and had what some refer to as a light bulb moment. And he realized, I'm exaggerating of course, but this actually did happen, that the principle of negativity, if you will, with which they had been separating the 12 available chromatic pitches from one another, could itself become a positive, constructive, technique for music composition. So Schoenberg realized you take all 12 chromatic available pitches, you lay them out in a series, and you do that in such a way as to take advantage of certain intervallic relationships between adjacent pitches, and you maintain those intervals for an entire composition, and you have something constructivist. That's the heart of 12-tone composition. So these slots, kind of like horses lining up for a race, represent what will happen to pitches and the intervals that result between them. So we will start to write these numbers above pitches in a row, and they're ordinals. In other words, this is the first note, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth, and that ordering will remain constant throughout everything we do with rows. Let's take the twelve-tone row upon which Webern's Wie bin ich froh, or How Happy I Am, is based. They're the full first twelve notes of the vocal part. The first note is G, or pitch class 7. The second note is E natural, or pitch class 4. The third note is D sharp, or pitch class 3. The fourth note, F sharp, pitch class 6. The fifth note, C sharp, or pitch class one. The sixth note is F natural, pitch class five. The seventh note is D natural, pitch class two. The eighth note is B natural, pitch class 11. The ninth note B flat, pitch class 10, the 10th note, C natural, pitch class 0, the 11th note, A natural, pitch class 9, and the 12th note is this G sharp, pitch class 8. So every 12 tone row has to have one and no more than one occurrence of each pitch class without duplication. So once you've had a seven, there's not going to be another seven. Once you've had a four, there's not going to be another four, etc. We put angle brackets around this row. 
the angle brackets mean this is an ordered series. We have a first note, a second note, a third note, and a fourth note. Now there are four permutations of every 12-tone row. A permutation is a transformation. It's something you can do to something. We can play this row left to right. We can play it right to left. We can play it left to right upside down or right to left upside down. And each of those permutations has a structure and a name. Left to right is prime. It's like the original form of the row, and it's named after the first pitch class. So this is P7. You see P7, and you know you have the prime left to right form of a row starting on pitch class G. If you play this same row backwards, that's R for retrograding. And we name the retrograde after the first pitch class of prime. So R7 means we have the retrograde of a prime form of a row that starts on G. Now, as you can imagine, we can also invert the row just as we've been inverting an atonal pitch class set theory. 7 inverts to 5, 4 to 8, 3 to 9, 6 to 6, 1 to 11, 5 to 7, 2 to 10, 11 to 1, 10 to 2, 0 to 0, 9 to 3, and 8 to 4. Now, if we play the inversion left to right, we have I5. If you see an I5, you know you have the inversion of a row whose prime form starts on the inversion of the first note, 7. If you have the retrograde of the inversion, you have RI5, which means the retrograde of an inversion of the row which starts on 5, whose prime form starts on G. So, P7, the original form of the row starting on pitch class G, R7, the retrograde of that row, I5, the inversion of all the pitch classes in the row starting on F, because 7 inverts to 5, and RI5, the retrograde of the inversion which starts on F, which is itself the inversion of the prime form starting on G. We can write out those pitches. And we have the first note of I5 is F. The second note is A flat. The third note, A natural. The fourth note, Sharp, the fifth note, B, the sixth note, G, the seventh note, B flat, the third note, I'm sorry, not the third, the eighth note, D flat or C sharp. The ninth note, just checking to make sure I don't make a mistake. D, the tenth note, C, the eleventh note, B e flat, and the twelfth note. E natural. And if you look at this, you can tell right away that the intervals invert. Minor third down, minor third up, etc. It's a complete mirror structure of each other. 
So here on the upper staff with the Arabic number, numbers underneath, we have P7 running this way, R7 running this way, I5 running that way, and RI5 running this way. Those are the four permutations of a 12-tone row. Sweet, right? There you have it. Now you get to watch me wash the board. When I was studying in Germany, this is the way they erase boards in Germany. Kind of like the Pulp Fiction thing about what they put on French fries in Holland. Except in Germany, they had a pail of water and a gigantic sponge, and water would drip all over the place. And then the professor would start writing in chalk on this wet board, upon which you could read absolutely nothing. And I thought, how could such a practice happen in such a civilized country as that? But I'm sure Europeans have similar questions about how we can possibly function with our electoral college and all sorts of things that seem to them to make less than no sense. Well, my favorite example of what a European asks us is, how can you possibly function in a language where you can't distinguish between you singular and you plural? Say easy, you said you guys or yous. The third thing I need to show you is how to find a row in a piece. Now, if the piece was written in Central Europe after 1923, you can be fairly certain it's serial. But that's anecdotal, that's really not a good criterion for whether a piece is serial or not, and whether or not it's easy or difficult to find a row. And first of all, let me mention that serialism is a technique for musical construction. It says absolutely nothing about what that piece will sound like. You can write a completely tonal serial piece. You can write a piece that sounds very atonal. You can write a piece that sounds popular. And in fact, 12-tone rows have been used in jazz before. To get back to the question, how to find the row in a piece, if I wrote out that, that row of wie bin ich froh, would you know that it's a row? And the answer is no. It could be atonal. It could be, well, here are all 12 pitches that radiate away from one another. You could segment the row in trichords, tetrachords, or hexachords and find cool pitch class sets in the subclasses to which they belong. So you know a piece is serial if you have 12 pitches arranged in a certain order, and then you see that the composer maintained that order afterwards. So if you see like a second permutation, if you see the row and then you see the row backwards, or you see the row and then you see the row upside down, then you know, ah, this is a serial composition where the composer is keeping track of the order of pitch classes. Where is the row? Well, in some composers, it's very easy to find the row. In Wie bin ich froh, it's pretty easy. It's the first 12 pitches the singer sings. Berg liked to make his rows themes. So he would, give it, he would give his row a characteristic shape, a characteristic dynamic, and he would make it melodious so that you would hear it as a theme. Schoenberg famously buried his rows. He didn't want you to hear it at all. He wanted it to be a method of composition that would withdraw into the background of the piece. I'm going to show you a way of approaching how to find rows. And it has to do with looking at the very first interval between the first and the second note of a row 
and the very last interval, the interval between the 11th and the 12th pitch. Consider those like tags. Consider it like if you're looking for something and you see a little flag in the ground and you pull it. That would be the beginning of the row or the end of the row if it's a retrograde. So let's say between the first and the second note, you have a characteristic interval of a row. And between the 11th and the 12th, you have an interval. So this is how a row begins. This is how a row ends. And let's take the Vipinichu row that I just had on the board. In prime, it starts with a descending minor third, G to F, pitch class, no, I'm sorry, G to E. Pitch class 7 to 4, it starts with minus 3. It ends minus 1, going from A to G sharp, or pitch class 9 to 8. So if you're in the middle of this piece and you don't know where the row is and you suddenly see a descending minor third, ah, maybe the first note of that interval is order number one and maybe the second note is order number two. Just let that ring. Similarly, if you see a descending minor second from the 11th note of the row to the 12th note of a row, maybe that's the end of a prime form of the row. Retrograde would be this backwards. If you start with an ascending minor second, maybe you have the first and second order numbers of a retrograde of a row. And an ascending minor third would be the 11th and the 12th. Right? So this backwards could signify retrograde. And this backwards could signify retrograde. For the inversion, minus 3 becomes plus 3. So if you have an ascending minor third, maybe that's order numbers 1 and 2 of an inversion. And if you have an ascending half step, maybe those are order numbers 11 and 12 of the inversion. For retrograde inversion, if you have a row that starts with a descending half step, right? So it's the reverse of this. Maybe it's retrograde inversion. And if it start, ends with three half steps down, maybe that's order numbers 11 and 12, or this reversed for a retrograde inversion. So this will become much clearer in use. I'm sure it seems rather abstract now. But the purpose of this is to show you that when you're looking for permutations of the row in the Benich flow, if a row starts with a descending minor third and ends with a descending half step, you might very well have prime. If a permutation starts with an ascending minor second and ends with an ascending minor third, you probably have retrograde. If a permutation begins with an ascending minor third and ends with an ascending half step, you probably have the inversion. And if a permutation starts with a descending half step and ends with a descending minor third, you probably have the retrograde inversion. So this is a way to keep track of characteristic intervals at the beginnings and ends of each of the four permutations in a 12-tone row. One more thing to show you, and then we will conclude. do with 
how rows connect to each other. So let's say you have a first note, a second note, an eleventh note, and a twelfth note, and then the row is over. You can always start a new permutation. Kind of like putting two bricks next to each other, right? Like brick, mortar, brick, right? A row begins and ends, and a new one begins and ends. Maybe you know where I'm going with this. Model number one is always possible. Model number two, a one note elision, is also always possible. You can have the first and the second, and then the 11th and the 12th note of a row just simply run out, and the 12th note of a row becomes the first note of the next row. That's simply a form of elision, and it's very common. There's nothing at all keeping a composer from doing this. That's rather like overlapping breaks. circumstances. You can have the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th note of a row. And the 11th note becomes the 1st, and the 12th becomes the 2nd of a row. 3 works only sometimes. And what would be really awesome if, is if you could give me an example on next Monday of a row in which number 3 is possible. That's extra, you don't need to know that. But what you need to know is that one and two are always possible and are very common. Three is more rare. And you could actually have deeper elisions that are possible in extremely unusual and rare circumstances, which you can imagine if you wish. So that's the material of today's lecture. I wanted to let you know how serialism developed wanted to tell you about the four permutations of a row, prime, retrograde, inversion, and retrograde inversion. Wanted to tell you how to find a row in a piece, particularly in noted, noting the first interval between order numbers one and two, and the last interval between order numbers 11 and 12, and how they work in prime, retrograde, inversion, and retrograde inversion. And lastly, I wanted to show you this structure for putting rows together. So thank you, and uh, at your leisure, watch the next video on making a matrix. And I'll see you Monday when I get back.